Welcome to Canal Town Community Church in our Sunday, April 26th worship service when we come together under different circumstances. So I hope you're joining us from your homes, from wherever is comfortable for you, wherever you can uh, worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Maybe you're worshiping during our normal hours, 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings, maybe in the evening, maybe, maybe some other time, but we are glad you're with us. I want to welcome you for being here, and I pray that you will continue to, to join us as we worship together, as we listen to God's Word, as we sing. Uh, today's message is going to be a little bit different than usual. Uh, I'm taking a different approach because I've been impacted by some statements that have been made relative to COVID-19 in the New York State, and why is the, the curve bending down? And those, those comments uh, really reflect perhaps something that's happening in a larger scale in our nation, and quite frankly, in the church as well. And I want to challenge the assumption that God is no longer essential. That's the things that are coming out. But first, let me make some announcements about what's going on and what we can expect. Uh, first of all, the kitchen renovations are about 95% complete. We're excited about what's getting done there. We're looking forward to when we can actually use the kitchen to serve the community in some new ways. I want to give special thanks to Henry Balk, who has been just a super helper. Henry is our next door neighbor, regular attender, and he uh, is always over here. When we're here doing some work, Henry's here to lend a hand. When we're not here. Henry's in here cleaning or organizing or painting. He, he loves to keep busy and he loves to serve at the church. So when you see Henry, make sure you give him a special thanks. Carpeting. The carpeting for the downstairs came in under budget, uh, so we're real happy about that. We're hoping that it could be installed before May 15th, and we might even be able to do the upstairs, the sanctuary, uh, depending on where that comes in. If we continue, continue to stay under budget, that will be exciting. Tentatively, planning for worship service here on May 17th. That's two days after the extended shutdown by the governor. We're going to have to keep watching it to see if anything changes. But if, if we are opened up, if the, the, the economy, if you will, the, the state is opened up more for business, let's, let's use that word, um, we're going to be ready to have public worship. We'll make sure we do pub, the social distancing, whatever is required of us. But I'm looking forward to when we can come together and worship together. Before we uh, sing, let's, let me pray. Almighty God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Almighty God, that you are on the throne and that you are in control. Lord, we so often fall short. We do fall short. And we tend to ignore you, even as a church. Forgive us for that, Almighty God. And rise us up, raise us up to honor you and to serve you in all that we do. Almighty God, be with us as we worship today, as we hear from your word. Draw us closer to you. Bring us into your presence. And Lord, allow us to stay there. And we give all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to open with the song Waymaker. Miranda and Samantha are going to lead us in the song. The words are on the screen. Whether you want to sing out loud or just contemplate the words as they're being sung, that's your choice. But let's praise God together. Thank you. 
I really love that song. It's uh, a good reminder that Jesus is the way maker. He is the, the miracle worker. Uh, the one that can take us through even something like COVID-19. And so thank you, Miranda and Samantha, for leading us in that song. Turn, if you will, to the scriptures. We're going to be reading from Psalm 14, verses 1 through 7. And uh, as I said, the message will be a little bit different as I'm not going to necessarily expound on that specific verse, these specific verses. I'm going to be using them as the, the jumping point for the, the ultimate message, is God non-essential? So uh, I'm reading from the New International Version. The words will be on the screen. Please feel free to, to look, use those, or if you have a copy of your scriptures with you, please follow along as I read. Psalm 14, verses 1 through 7. It says, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men and daughters of women to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evildoers never learn, those who devour my people as men eat bread and do not call on the Lord? There they are, overwhelmed with dread, for God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that the salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. Let's pray. Almighty God, help us to hear you in your word. Hide me behind the cross, Lord, that we might grow in the knowledge of your truth and what you want us to see, Lord. Help us, Almighty God, to see and perceive, to hear and digest. Lord, we love you, and we call on you to open our eyes and our ears. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The text that I grabbed was um, because of, as I said, a message or a comment that the governor made at a press conference last week. And I, I need to emphasize something. My goal is not to be political. I'm not here to say one party is wrong or one person is wrong. But what he said um, really shows something that's happening in America today. So my intent is not be, to be political. I, I hope that you won't take it that way. Um, quite frankly, uh, I want to be just the opposite because quite frankly, politics on all sides seem to be content with the slippery slope that we're, we're going on. But likewise, it's not just politics. I would say that the church itself is forgetting its first love. We are forgetting that God is essential. And it's not new. Uh, this has been happening for a long time. There's been authors that have written and warned about it. Um, and so the question is, have we fallen asleep? Or perhaps we felt, well, no, we're good and strong and we're, we're seeking after God so we can ignore it. Maybe that's another issue. Um, but what was the alarm for me, and there have been many, was Governor Cuomo's response to a question at the press conference last week. And the question that was asked of him was, why is the COVID-19 infection rate slowing down in New York? That was the question. His response was, and I quote, the number is going down because we brought it down. God did not do that. Faith did not do that. Destiny did not do that. A lot of pain and suffering did that. Now, when you hear that answer, you, your immediate response might be, well, yeah, there was a lot of pain. There was people that died. Uh, the shut-in has certainly affected a lot of us. The economy shut down. That is hurting. So, yes, there is a lot of uh, pain and suffering. And, and I understand that perhaps the governor was trying to commend the hard work of so many people and, and the efforts that he was taking to try to bring the curve down. Uh, perhaps he was saluting all of us who have... Um, taken on lots of restrictions in order to see the COVID-19 curve go down. But for some reason, he, need, he felt the need to speak against God. Um, he needed to say, God didn't help. Faith means nothing. We did it all by ourselves. And, and that puzzles me because 
Governor Cuomo, I know, is a practicing Catholic, and perhaps he's having a crisis of faith given all that's happening, and maybe he lashed out. Maybe that's the answer. I don't know. Um, he's not the first to lash out like that, and he won't be the last. But the church must wake up. The church must stand for the glory of God. God-fearing people, Christians of various faith traditions, must find their voice. We must find our voice. Perhaps you recall the, the statement by uh, Martin Niemöller. or he was a, a German Lutheran pastor who uh, originally supported Adolf Hitler uh, in Germany until he saw the direction that Hitler was going and the power he was trying to grab. And he made a speech, and within that speech he said, first they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came out for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Strong words, and quite frankly, the entire speech was very powerful in recognizing that the church had fallen asleep. And what was called the, the uh, confessing church had turned a blind eye to what was happening in Germany. Uh, and the, the bottom line is, I think, and I'm not equating us today with Nazi Germany, please don't misunderstand that, but I think the church is turning a blind eye to what is happening today. When people say things like, it's not God, and God didn't help, and, and we did it all by ourselves, those I think are dangerous things. We have fallen into what I call a new and a dangerous reality. When, in the context of COVID-19, essential things are liquor stores and abortion services, for instance, and non-essential is church worship services, and in that sense, God is irrelevant. And that scares me, because God will not be mocked. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. We live in a postmodern world, and in the Britannica definition or um, explanation or description of postmodernism, it says it is a late 20th century movement characterized by broad skepticism, subjectivism, and relativism, a general suspicion of reason and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in inserting and maintaining political and economic power. Thought has evolved over the years. From the founding of this country to today, there has been a downward trend in a recognition of re religion, and specifically Christianity, in the world today. Think of the evolution of thought that has taken place. George Washington once said, it is impossible to govern the world without God. It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of the Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly implore His protection and favor. Fast forward many years, Ronald Reagan said, I believe with all my heart that standing up for America means standing up for the God who has so blessed our land. We need God's help to guide our nation through stormy seas. But we can't expect him to protect America in a crisis if we just leave him over on the shelf in our day-to-day -day living. Still a reliance of God, and that's not a comment about the Christianity of George Washington or Ronald Reagan, just the recognition that political leaders were boldly standing and speaking out for the need to recognize God. Fast forward a little bit longer, the evolution of thought former President Barack Obama, and he said that given the increasing diversity of America's population, the dangers of secretarianism has never been greater. Whatever we once were, we are no longer just a Christian nation. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. Now, what he said was is true. It, we are made up of a very diverse population. There are a lot of religious and theological uh, slants, if you will, in America. No doubt about that. My concern is that what he said, although true, also suggested a equivalence. Like, hey, they're all good. They're all the way. And that's not the fact. And that's not a knock against 
individuals that are seeking after God in different ways. It's a recognition that it's not all equivalent. No, it does not mean, oh, you must be a Baptist, you must be a Catholic, you must be a Presbyterian or Episcopalian. No, that is not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is the evolution of thought from political leaders has gone from a recognition of God in this country to a, if you will, movement away from him to not recognize the importance of, of God in our world and specifically in our country. So what has happened? Why has this happened? I would suggest to you that politicians tend to mirror the population and we have an increasingly secular society. Politicians often put their finger in the wind to see which way or finger in the air in order to see which way the wind is blowing and follow what they sense is the popular notion. And secularism is certainly increasing in society today. But I would also suggest that the church has failed to honor its purpose. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus is talking to some of the disciples and he has, is talking about this revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he is the Messiah, and he says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. When I read that verse, I notice something very important. It says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And when you think about gates, you think about a defense. In the, the ancient times and in, in uh, uh, our past history, forts were built that had walls around them with, with gates that could be open and closed to let people in that they wanted. And if an enemy came and tried to attack those forts, those castles, the gates were closed so they couldn't get in. And the idea is that the church should be able to pound the doors of hell down and we should be able to uh, overcome the influence of Satan, the influence of the accuser, the deceiver, that the church should stand up against a lie. But the church is also not reflecting Christ in the world and that's perhaps what concerns me the most. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 says, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of your, their slander. Critical part of that verse to me is, but do it in gentleness and respect. I've, I've talked about this before. Perhaps it's on one of the videos that I've done in earlier messages. The idea is that we should live in such a way that people ask us, why do you have a hope? Why do you believe the way you believe? And then we're to give an answer with gentleness and respect. The question is, are we doing that? Or are we... Um, degrading somebody else's ways? Are we, we um, criticizing? Are we uh, not doing it with gentleness and respect and quite frankly with love? When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandments were, he said in Mark chapter 12 verses 30 and 31, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So the question we have to ask ourselves as a church is, are we living those great commandments? Are we loving the Lord our God with all our mind, with all our strength, with all our, our uh, uh, soul? Are we really loving him? Because that should show in our actions and those actions should be demonstrated by how we treat our neighbor. And, and neighbor doesn't mean just the person living next to you. It, it means how do we treat people around us? Because that's what draws people to Christ when they see the love of Christ in people. James chapter 1 verse 27 says this, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Are we reaching out to those who have less? We don't have a lot in, in this congregation. We're a small congregation, but are we living the loving of God and loving of neighbor? and living the, the religion 
that God the Father accepts of being willing to go out of our way to help those around us. Our mission statement that we have made as a church is to show God's love in tangible ways with no strings attached. That's not always easy and sometimes, sometimes we'll be taken advantage of. But the question is, what are we reflecting to the world? We have to be smart, we have to be wise, but are we reflecting Christ to this world? Do we love the Lord our God so much so that we allow him to work through us? So continuing on this, this question about what has happened. We talked about politicians that tend to, to follow what society is doing in the society and more and more becoming secular. We've talked about this church as forgetting its first love and not reflecting Christ and perhaps not acting in gentleness and respect when it comes to sharing our faith. And then living in such a way that people see something different and it draws them to Christ. But the church has become secondary in this world today. This is from a Barna Access report called, on a report called Reviving Evangelism, in which they said, and by the way, Barna is a well-respected research organization that does, has been doing research on the church attitudes towards religion and the Bible and things like that for years. And they, they make the statement in this report, the portion, proportion of Christians in America is declining, a clear trend that is likely to continue, especially because the Generation Z self-identifies as atheist at twice the rate of a adults overall. They have been looking at the data and sending out surveys and questioning people for a long time and they see what we all know, that Christianity is declining in the Western world, specifically America. By the way, it is increasing in the areas that we would least likely expect it, places like Iran and China. But in the Western world, it is declining. Along with the reports they did, they find that there is a new moral code. This, this is somewhat disturbing to me because it talks about of a, of a thousand uh, adults practicing Christians as well as non-Christians uh, or, or people that of, of no faith perhaps. And it says, what is the, the way that you indicate that you agree with um, these statements? And the statement, for instance, the best way to find yourself is looking within yourself. 76% of the Christians surveyed said that was the answer. People should not criticize someone else's life choices. 76% of the Christians said that is true. Now, let me make a point here. Our, our task is not to criticize someone else's choices. We're supposed to be there to, with the gentleness and respect. Um, I'm not supposed to go after someone and, and, and condemn them. Remember Jesus when he was given the woman that they said they caught in adultery and they said, you know, will you stone her? And he said, he who has the first, who, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then to her he said, I don't condemn you. Leave your life of sin. Um, so it's not about criticizing, but the fact of the matter is what this survey seems to suggest is people say everybody should do whatever they want. It, it's not a matter of one idea is bad and one idea is good. To be filled and fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things you desire the most. Boy, if, if we all went after the things we desired the most, we might be in a lot of trouble. Because for many people, it's going to be money. It's going to be fame. And, and you'll step over anybody you can to get it. That's, that's a sad commentary. The highest goal in life is to enjoy it as much as possible. I want to enjoy life. I want to, I want to live life to the fullest. But again, if enjoyment is my goal, then who else do I step on in order to get that enjoyment? The bottom line is interest in church and specifically in Christ is declining and we are letting it decline because we're not living it ourselves and that's something we need to be very much aware of. Along with the, the research that Barn has done was this. It says describe activities you consider part of practicing faith or spirituality. Look at what some of them are on there. Marijuana, sex, walking outdoors, Good things, by the way, hospice volunteering, um, charity, all good things. But is that really what practicing your faith is about? Yes, if I practice my faith, I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be reading the Bible. I'm going to be looking to give in charity. I'm going to be looking towards helping and volunteering and things like that. Those are good things. But if you look at that full list, 
many of them have nothing to do with a real spiritual matter. I like to cycle. Uh, and quite frankly, I do a lot of praying when I'm cycling, but cycling in itself is not something that practices my faith or spirituality. It's important for us to recognize that the church is not a social club. There are lots of good social clubs, Rotary Club, Kiwanis, all those. But the purpose of the church is to glorify God, to edify believers, to build up, disciple believers, to, to help those who are seeking find Christ. It is to reflect God's love, what we were talking about before, this idea of gentleness and respect and letting people see Christ in you, the hope of glory, and to proclaim Christ. And I hope that we do that faithfully here on Sundays and at any time we meet. And quite frankly, when we're alone and with other people, that we might be reflecting Christ and proclaiming Christ. C.S. Lewis said this, and I, I really appreciate this. It says, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a re religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. Now, don't misunderstand that statement. It doesn't mean that the church is a place for stoic, self-righteous religionists who forget how to laugh. No, to the contrary, Jesus said, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Old Testament, the psalmist wrote, You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. The church should be a place of joy, but it shouldn't be looked at as a social club and a place where I do good things to earn something. No, I do good things because I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind. And I want to reflect that love to the world around me so that the world might ask me why I have the hope. And then the response in gentleness and love. I think there's a solution, though. The solution is found in words such as Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Be careful to watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and their children after them. The idea is to remember what God has done in our lives. Remember what God has done in this world. When you see and a wonderful thing like the curve of COVID-19 going down, recognize that God is involved. God is essential. God is a part of the solution. God is in control. And when we remember the good things God has done, even during times of trouble, it reminds us of his grace. It reminds us of his control. And it reminds us that he is good. I mentioned this verse earlier. It's from Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. It says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. I fear when we say things such as, God didn't do it, faith didn't do it, that we are, in a sense, mocking God. I fear when the governor, the leader of our state, makes those types of statements. It makes me think of the book of Exodus when Moses approached the Pharaoh and said, God, the Lord God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should let them, to go, let them go? It is a, it is a mockery. It is a, a slam to who God is. And God will not be mocked. There are some facts that we should consider. God is essential. And the church needs to recognize that and reflect on it. God created intelligence and wisdom. And praise God if you are blessed with it. If you have the special talents, you're a scientist, and you have those skills and the ability to look for uh, solutions and, and uh, ways to come up with a vaccine for a, a virus, praise God that he gave you that ability and that gift. Use it for God's glory. God can and will do so much more if we turn to him first, if we recognize who he is. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, 
then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. So where are you and where am I in all this? What's our attitude? Is God essential? Is the church essential? Is God essential in your life, in my life? Or is it just a feel-good figment of our imagination, something that we, we use as a crutch? I hope not. Is your faith strong or weak, depending on the circumstances you're going through? When times are good, do you forget God? And when times are bad, that's when you start calling out and asking him where he is. When trouble comes, is your first response to look within yourself for the answer or to call out to God? It could be conflicts you're having. It could be illnesses you're going through. It could be all sorts of disasters. Where do you go to first? I would say to you that God is essential. And we need to recognize the almighty God for who he is and trust in him for what he can do. We need to turn from the secular path that we're going to as a nation and as a church and remember our first love and turn to him. Almighty God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I pray that you'll open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear. Help us, Almighty God, to recognize just how essential you are. Help us, Almighty God, as a people and as a nation to turn back to you, that you might heal this land. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with a song, At Your Name. It's another song that I love because it reminds us of who God is and the power that he has. Let's sing.